And thanks for coming out to church. We're so glad you're here. And I think most of you know, we've been in a series called Six. And the series is about the six basic doctrines in Hebrews chapter six. And we're gonna get back to that. I felt like I was supposed to put a pause on it. I wanna tell you why and how, um, because I don't take these things lightly when it does happen. Um, We have first Saturday prayer every first Saturday. And my wife was leading it this past week, just last Saturday. And I was sitting there and she was reading a scripture, right, the one I'm gonna read to you in a moment. And when she was reading it, I was like, wow, that's really good. And while I started praying after she read the scripture, you have to understand when we're praying, she'll walk around, you know, and we had a little thing just like this, a little pulpit thing, and I saw that the scripture was up there, and I'm like, I gotta go up there and find out what that scripture was again in the translation, because while I was praying, I felt like the Lord said this in my heart, I want you to switch your message this weekend and preach on this. And I was like, do you not know that I'm in a series? (laughs) He does. So I'll get back to that, what we were doing in the series, but I I felt like I was supposed to teach on this, so I'm gonna read it before I give you a title or anything. We'll push pause on the series. We only have, by the way, we only have one one message left in the series. There's six messages. The last one is eternal judgments. We'll get to that the next time that we pick up on that. Psalm 78, verse four through eight is the scripture my wife was reading during prayer. It says this, we will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord. Let me ask you this, you can look up just for a moment. How many think God cares about the next generation? Anyone think that God cares about the next generation? So all of us have like next gen kids, people under us, right? They're not kids anymore. Like the next generation under me, they're not kids, they're adults. But you know this as well as I do. Our church right now is filled with next generation kids here and then also in our classrooms. It's filled with them. Why? Because people actually still do care that their kids find out about this. Amen? He says, the glorious sees the Lord about his power and his mighty wonder. So guys, you're in church today. You're here in this right now. God's already moving. God's already done some stuff before we got to this point right here. Please don't not tell your kids what God does here. This is what he's trying to get across. Watch verse five. For he he issued his laws to Jacob and gave his commandments to Israel. He commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children. So they were commanded to teach these things. Verse six, and this is my title of my message, by the way, this weekend so the next generation might know. So the next generation might know. I don't know about you, but that just speaks something to my heart. So the next generation might know. Know what? Know them, even the children not yet born. And they in turn will teach their own children. So each generation should set its hope anew on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his commands. Then, They will not be like their ancestors. Check it out. Stubborn, rebellious, unfaithful, refusing to give their hearts to God. So what we see in all of this scripture right here is the heart of God for people, but especially for that next generation. And I know if you've been in our church, you've heard me say it before, but I just want to remind you of something. So my wife and I We're on staff with my brother Joe in Warren, Ohio. Many of you know who my brother Joe is, and in fact, many of you know this. It was on social media. My brother Joe had a stroke a few weeks back, uh, and it was not good. Um, And today, he's preaching at his church. He's 100%, no, no sign of a stroke. I'm thankful. And I know a lot of you were praying. I know a lot of you saw it on social media. Many of you texted me and were like, hey, what happened to your brother? And what happened is he had a brain bleed, not an actual, the normal kind of stroke, but one of his vessels in his brain started bleeding and it caused him to have the slurred speech, caused him not to be able to walk properly. But within a week and a half, he was out of the hospital and the doctor said, you're gonna need um, weeks and weeks of rehabilitation. Within a couple days, they told him, "We we don't know what's going on, but you're fine. You don't need any of that. So thank God for Jesus, amen? So I'm thankful for that from my brother. But my, my wife and I were his youth pastors. So today, in a little bit, we're ordaining our, what we've called up to this point, our youth director, Austin, is going to be ordained in the ministry as a pastor. And um, we, we were Austin and Caroline. 
it, we were doing the exact same thing at my brother Joe's church. So you never know what God will wind up doing with you in the long run, if you'll stick with it. Amen? Why I said all that is this. We have a heart. Our church has been born out of and a heart for the next generation. So we have a bunch of kids right now that the reason why you can sit here and you don't have kids yelling right now and you don't have your kid running around and doing all this stuff is because we have classrooms that are teaching them about Jesus. Right, I mean, I, I think it's important they're learning about Jesus. So that this next generation might know is what I wanna talk to you about. And we're gonna be praying for students, by the way, and um, actually the first prayer that is gonna come out of the mouth of a brand new ordained minister, Austin, will be for students, teachers, and all of those that are in the school system. We're gonna be doing that here in a few moments. I think that's pretty cool, by the way, that it's just the first prayer that's gonna come out of his mouth as an ordained minister is going to be for you in a few minutes. So the next generation might know. So Mother's Day weekend, let me just tell you this real quick. I did a message called Speaking Up for the Next Generation. And if you haven't heard that one, I would go encourage you to hear it. I believe these two sort of connect together. But I will just tell you this. I don't believe, I don't care how old you are, I don't believe we can hate, dislike, despise the next generation. I don't see God doing that. God always cared about the next generation. So if you're here and you're like, man, I'm older and like, I don't wanna really hear this message, I'm older and I wanna hear it. So I think we have to get over ourselves. You're older, yes, you are. But there are younger people that need Jesus in the era that we're living in right now. The culture we're living in is, if you haven't found it out yet, I want, to, I want you to hear this. The culture we're living in is after the children. And the church has got to say no to that and say, no, we're gonna, we're gonna have guys like Austin, we're gonna have guys like Jacob that are gonna rise up and say, nope, we're gonna preach the word of God, we're gonna give them Jesus, because we need that now in this hour more than we ever have. We have Amy, we have April back there, they're doing amazing jobs with the kids, but guys, we need children to come back to God, back to the word, back to Jesus, and you and I, are responsible for that. So God saw some value. Now let me show you this. Psalm, the psalmist, he's saying, man, that next generation, let me show you something that happened that we don't want to have happen. Watch this in Judges. Chapter two, verse seven, verse 10. Moses had died, Joshua had died, and now judges were raised up. They were the guys that were sort of the ones leading the children of Israel. Watch this. Verse seven, and the Israelites served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua. And the leaders who outlived him, those who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. After that generation died, everyone say after. After that generation died, another generation grew up who did not acknowledge the Lord or remember the mighty things that he had done for Israel. Here's what I wanna ask you. Do we want there to be a generation who doesn't remember? I don't. I don't want there to be a generation who doesn't remember what God has done. So I grew up in a different generation than some of you, and I had a spiritual father who I looked up to. He's gone. But I can remember some of the things he spoke over my life, that I would be one of the people, not just me, but many, would be a person who would carry on the word of God, the legacy of what God has done, that I would be part of that. So we're not gonna let go and say, you know what, we're all good, it's all for us older people and you younger people find out for yourself. No, we're gonna show Jesus to the younger people and we're gonna have them show it to the younger ones that are under them and we're not gonna stop, amen? So we wanna be like the psalmist. We wanna be the one that says, we wanna make sure the next generation will know. So I wanna talk to you about some things concerning that and um, here's some things that I think God wants us, first of all, older people, middle-aged, you know, even if you're in your 30s or 40s, you're still older than anyone sitting right here that's part of our young people that come and sit on the front row during church because they love Jesus so much. Can we give it up for them? That's amazing. But uh, if you're 30, you're already old. I know you might not think you're old in, in and of yourself. I get all that. I don't feel old and I'm, I'm way over that. So the bottom line is this. The next generation is so vital. And we need to grab onto them, hold onto them, 
and say, we will not let you do anything but serve God. We are not letting you go to hell and we're not letting culture wrap itself around you and take you down wrong paths and make you confused about everything concerning your life. We're gonna grab onto you and show you what Jesus is like and that Jesus is the man of all men. He walked on this earth. He dominated the devil while he was on this earth. There was nothing that could take him down. He had to give his own life up. He laid his life down. Man could not even take that away from him. Amen. So let's talk about this, this younger generation and things we should know about them. They belong to God. You say, well, yeah, no no kidding, Pastor. But watch this, Psalm 127, verse three. Children are a heritage from the Lord. So parent, grandparent, great-grandparent, whoever you are, they're a gift from God. The offspring, a reward from the Lord. There's an old saying, you might've heard it before, the Lord has no grandchildren. So here's what I want you to know, parents. Your kids have to be taught how to have a relationship themselves with God. They don't get to proxy in through you. Well, my, my, my grandparents, my parents, they, no, they, they don't, they don't none, none of that matters. They have to know Jesus themselves. How do they know Jesus themselves? By you showing them. Are y'all with me? One of our grandkids, Bear, he's five years old and his name says it all. He's actually here in church today with us. Um, he's in class, but... Bears, he should be a football player. I mean, I'm gonna push forward as hard as I can. Um, He's just got that body and I'm like, dude, you should just be a football player. But anyway, I watch him go to my wife who he calls Nina and sit on a chair and there are times she just is able to tell him about God, about Jesus, about things of God. Don't take these things lightly, guys. When you have a grandkid that wants to come sit in your lap, love them. Don't push Jesus down if they don't want to hear it. I'm not saying that. But man, when they're five years old, they think you're it. So you can tell them, man, you know, Jesus, he's done some great things. You know, when you don't feel well, Jesus can heal you. All right, we'll move on. So parents, you have to trust, grandparents, you have to trust to let God move in their lives. You show them Jesus, you display Jesus, but you you have to go ahead and trust that God can have a relationship with them. But students, I wanna talk to you just for a minute. I want you to listen to this. You have to grow up and have a personal relationship with Jesus yourself. Don't, Don't depend on me, don't depend on Austin and Caroline, don't depend on Jacob, don't depend on whoever. You must have your own relationship, just like we do, amen? I think for parents, I want you to jot this down if you're taking notes, and I I forgot to say this, our notes are available if you wanna follow along. Um, I know many of you do that, so that's great. But there's a prayer that, it's a simple prayer that you can pray daily that I jotted down. How about this, parents, grandparents? God, I put them in your hands. How many think they're better in God's hand than yours? That doesn't mean you don't train them, that doesn't mean you don't do the right things. But God, I put them in your hands. And then how about this? Not my will, but your will be done in their lives. Not my will. You can take it further. Not my plan, but your plan. Not my pursuits, but your pursuits. When my kids were younger, especially my son, I played football. And I wanted him to play football. I'm like, why why wouldn't you even want to do that? What would be wrong with you? I'm just kidding. I never said that to him. He played basketball, he played baseball, and then he found the bass. And one day I was playing my bass in the basement. He said, hey, teach me how to do that. Just a little kid. I showed him a couple things on the bass, and within a month I think he was better than I ever was. I was like, ah, there's a gift. That doesn't come natural to anyone. Are you with me? And now today, I mean, he loves, how many, how many had kids that they grew up with Mario? I know there's a movie out now, but our kids grew up playing Mario and all that stuff. And I, my son was so good at it. Just, I was like, hey, dad, you want to play me? I'm like, no, I don't want to play you <laughs> with you. I'll, I mean, I'll sit here and let you destroy me the whole time. But yes, I'll, I'll do that. Now he's a video production guy that does videos that just blow my mind. And so what happened? God gifted him for a certain thing. Your kids are gifted. Not my will, but your will be done in their lives, God. Not my plan, but your plan. Not my pursuits for their life, but your pursuits. But I know this about kids. They require our intentionality. Your kids, my kids, my grandkids, our grandkids, 
Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way that he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. My wife and I are first generation Christians. So that, what that means is this, my mom and dad did not know Jesus. They found Jesus after we did. So we're first generation, so we knew nothing about how do we raise our kids as Christians. I didn't know any of that. When my son turned 16 years old, we gave him a, a vehicle that he could drive, and we went one day to pick him up, and it, it was at school, and somehow, some way, we found out the CD that was in his, in his uh, system plane. And as good of a parent that I wanted to be, and I'll get to this in a moment, some of you think we're perfect. We're perfect parents. You are so wrong. Like, that is the craziest thing to ever think. We're people just like you are. And I remember finding this CD in there called Corn. K O R N. Some of you know by the looks on your face. And then my wife went and found out the words. We were like, Dear Jesus, which devil do we start casting out? I mean, it was just like, it was like crazy stuff. And I remember another Christian had sort of turned him on to that. Aren't you glad when another Christian turns your kid on to something that you're like, who do I kill first, that person that gave it to him or my son? Like, that's how you feel. Are y'all, y'all with me? But you know what? Every one of our kids need intentionality. They need us to pour our lives into their lives. And even though our son did that, we loved him regardless. And we, we worked with him through all of that regardless. Are y'all with me? Why I'm telling you all that is we need to learn how to train our kids in the direction they need to go, Right? But not just serving God, that's one thing, but how to live life. We don't want to have a bunch of young people that grow up and they're like, I I don't know how to live. I don't know how to get out on my own. I don't know how to keep a job. We want to train them in those areas and teach them. That's what this is dealing with. But every kid's different. How many many would uh, agree with me that each one of your kids, if you have more than one, they're all different personalities. They're all at different stages to receive what you have to say to them. Everyone's different, right? We, we, We all know it. Wouldn't it have been awesome if God just said, they're all going to be just like, boom, boom, they're all the same. My mom had seven boys, seven. None of us are the same. My brother Joe preached here uh, last year. You, you notice he's like totally different than I am. He's real nice, real gentle, real kind. The complete opposite of what he was like before he accepted Christ. He carried a gun. He was always like getting in fights. And all he had to do is give you a look in it from his eyes and you'd be like, okay, thank you, Jesus. I'll go the other way. I mean, he was that kind of a meme. And then Jesus came into his heart. Wow, amazing. I found out some things back years ago that I've never really used them in a message, but I had them sitting and I thought I'm gonna use them in this message because it gives you an idea of when your kids are a different age, what you should be as a parent for them. So grandparents, parents, future people who have, if you're in here right now, a a guy, girl that you're planning on getting married and having a kid down the road, I I would write these down. So from the age of being born, zero to five, it's the discipline years. They learn how to obey you. They learn how to obey, period. How many would agree that's an important time? We live in a society right now that almost thinks you don't have to do any of this. Listen, guys, that's where you learn. That's where you learn, don't touch the stove. That's where you learn, man, right now, if I do this, I'm going to go out on that road right there. I could get hit by a car. That's where they learn how to obey. Then how about the training years, age five to 12? They learn the why behind the what. And I want to tell every parent that's here, if your kids are between ages five and 12, it's some of the most important time of their life right now, that they learn the why behind the what. And then coaching years, That'd be 12 to 18, and some of you are, your kids are right in this age group. They learn the relationship between action and result. See, we live in a culture right now, guys, you agree with me probably on this, that they're not learning that you have this action, you have this result. Right now they're learning, I can do anything that I want and get away with it. No, you can't. You can't even do that in God's eyes. Let alone, we live in a world that's sort of letting things go crazy right now, but guys, for every action, there is a result. In your coaching years with your kids, you need to teach them that. And then lastly, there's the friendship years. And if you're jotting this down, it's 18 plus. 
We wanna raise our children that actually wanna be with us after the race. Can anyone say amen? They wanna be with us and with each other when they grow up. That's what we want. So as I close up that little part of what I'm talking about, let me, I wanna move on to something else, but I do wanna tell you this. There are some things that I found in a, a book that I was reading back years ago are four T's that every parent, grandparent, great-grandparent should know, four T's. So I want you to write them down. Your kids need these four T's. One, time. They need your time. And I, I don't have my phone, I forgot to bring it. I wanted to do this to make it sure that you could see it clearly. This, while they're over here playing, is not giving them your time. This, while they're over here doing, that is not your time. That's foolish. They're not getting any time, but we think it's time. That's not time. While you're in the same room, that's it. You're in the same room. You gotta give them time. You gotta make time. You gotta actually, eye to eye, be talking. Not this. I'll move on. Come on now. Time. But you know what else kids need? They need touch. They need touch from their parents. Can you say amen? They need touch. When our kids were young, of course, just like any other parent, our kids were all over us all the time. We had them in our arms all the time. But then they get older. But they still need touch. Our grandkids right now, three of them live with us, three years old, five years old, 13 years old. They're all over us. These three years, the three-year-old and the five-year-old, just always, always. And we do not deny one bit of that. You know what I'm talking about? So here's what I want to tell you. Your kids need, remember they came and touched Jesus. They touched him. Touch is important. But so is talk. Your kids need you to talk to them. They need to talk to you. There are times we regret at times because I was sort of a, I, I grew up in a family where my dad, I tell you the story sometimes, was very strong. He was in the military. Um, he was a medic, but he was a very strong kind of guy, Italian guy. So I had sort of some of that that I sort of transferred right over into me and to my kids where I'm like, don't do that. Well, you're trying to be a Christian at the same time you're yelling at him. And then you're like, am I really a Christian or not? You being strong doesn't mean that you're not a Christian. But just remember, you have to have times where your kids can talk to you and know that they can trust you. They should trust you more than anyone else to talk to. I gotta move on. Last thing I wanna tell you is all families, moms, dads, grandma, grandpas, we need traditions. Our family has, we have some birthday traditions we've done our, our whole lives with our kids all the way through. We have a Christmas tradition. Anyone here have some Christmas traditions? Let me see your hands, yeah? So Christmas tradition for us looks like this. Um, on Christmas morning, they're coming to our house and we're making breakfast and the whole family's gonna be eating together. Not because they have to, they actually want to. But then it's Christmas. So you get hungry two hours later. So then we do something for lunch and then we make a dinner that is amazing. You know why? It's all Italian food. So that's always awesome. So whatever background you are, you gotta have some traditions, right? I, I, I'll say this real quickly. There's a saying that goes like this. The days are long, but the years are short. And I watched this with my daughter when she had Sunday. He, she's a brand new baby, and Bear was only two or three years old at the time. And I watched her go through a winter where she hardly ever went out of that house one time. The days are long, baby. And I remember thinking, God bless her. I started praying for her. I felt for her. I was like, man, that is, that is a life. The days are long, but the years are short. And you know what that means? It happens so fast that you're like, oh my gosh, they're grown up now. Let me, let, me, let me say this last one. They need us to fight for them. And I said something similar to this back on Mother's Day weekend, but in Nehemiah chapter four, verse 14, after I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families, fight for your sons, your daughters, your wives, your homes. Guys, our kids need us to fight for them. I wanna jump on that part of this. 
Our kids need us to fight for them. I'm not talking about physical fighting. I have a scripture here if you want to go look at it later, but Ephesians 6, 10 through 12, it says this, part of it, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. We're not fighting people. We're fighting against the spirits that are trying to influence them in this culture that we live in right now. Can you say amen? So let me give you a few takeaways and we'll be done. And as I said, in a moment, we're going to have you that are going to school this year, back to school, teachers, um, anyone that works at a school at all. We're going to have you actually come down front in a moment. We're going to pray over you. So get ready to do that in a minute. And Austin's actually going to be the one. But before we get to it, we're going to ordain Austin. But before we get to that, let me give you some takeaways. Here's something I think is important. It takes all of us to raise our kids. You say, what? In other words, we do our part. Uh, we need to know exactly what to do, but we don't know sometimes. I remember times when my wife and I were like, I don't know what to do. Then you go talk to someone, they're like, we don't either. Then you go talk to someone else, yeah, we don't either. And you're like, dear Jesus, do you know? He does. But here's what I found out. It takes all of us to raise them. It takes all of us to be praying for them. African proverb that I love, it takes a village to raise a child. It takes a village to raise a child. In other words, guys, parents, grandparents, we're all needed together. Church family, we're needed together to raise our kids. I say, man, we're gonna do the best for them that we can do. Um, so if you're a younger person here, you need not just peers. You need some of us older people that you look at and you're like, oh, they're old. <laughs> but you still need us. Are you all with us? Yeah? But when you go to school this year, there are people in your school that need you. So what you get here, you're going to school. They need what you got. Someone's gonna need you this year. Second thing, and this is for parents, because I think sometimes you can walk away from a message like this and feel like condemned. There are no perfect parents. There are, there's a perfect God that we serve, but there are no perfect parents. And I think there are times where people, as we are raising our kids, and my, my son, Michael, there were times that he, my, my daughter, I felt like, oh, thank you, Jesus. She was so good. But my son was like, the, like my son was like I was before I accepted Christ. I was like, what's going on? Someone came up to me one time and they said, I thought your kids were perfect. I was like, you thought wrong. Because I'm the pastor of a church, for some reason they thought that meant your kids are perfect. They're not ever gonna be perfect, guys. And you're not gonna be perfect. But guess who is perfect? There is a perfect God that you serve that can help you no matter what you are facing with your kids, amen? But I wanna close with this. There's a scripture in Matthew chapter one, verse 23. Before I give you this point, it says this. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. I want you to write this down if you're taking notes. Third thing, God is with us. What do you mean? To help us. I don't know about you, but there are times I need help. There are times I'm not sure what to do. Even now, after all these years, I'm like, I, I don't know. But God is here to help us. So I wanna, I wanna show you this, and I think it's, it's so important to understand. God is with us to help us. He's with parents. He's with the kids. When you guys start school this year, you should walk in thinking, God is with me. I'm going into school with God. Oh, that kid's gonna be there that sort of gives you a hassle? I'm going in with God. God's got you. God's gonna help you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, Paul's going through a little bit of a thing. Um, this thing's happening with someone that's sort of coming against him. And he goes to God complaining, basically, to God. And in verse 9, it says, but he said to me, God, Jesus, really, it's in red letter, my grace is sufficient for you. Can I say this to all the students? God's grace is sufficient for you when you go back to school this year. Can I say this to all the parents? And raising your kids, God's grace is sufficient for you. If you're like, pastor, I don't know what to do. I, is there a book I can read? There's a ton of them. But there's then like a really good one too, right here. You could actually just say, you know what? I think I'll read this book. It's a good book to read. It'll teach you about disciplining your kids. It'll teach you about loving your kids. It'll teach you about how to treat them properly. Read your Bible. But also there's some great books out there. I'm not gonna recommend any right now, but 
Jesus said this to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I'll boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Hmm. So let's talk about this in closing. Let's talk about the fact that when your kids and you wake up every single day, that his presence is with us. I love praise and worship. You heard me say earlier, I played the bass. I actually played the keyboards, the drums, and the bass, and none of them really that well. Actually, the bass is my better instrument, but I, as a person who grew up in music, love this. I love coming into worship. I love praising. I love all of it. I love it. I don't want to do it ever without it. If you ever wonder why it's like it is, it's my fault. Because I just absolutely love praise and worship. Our team loves it. But let me just say this to you. Please do not regulate. God's presence is just with that. His presence lives in you. All you young guy, yeah, girls and guys that are going to school, just in a week or whatever it's gonna be, you're going in with his presence. But not only that, his peace. His peace is with us. How many agree? His peace. You say, well, what do you mean peace? Well, the word peace in the Old Testament, shalom, it literally means nothing missing, nothing broken, but it also means this, to have a calmness or a peace to come in the midst of chaos. How many would agree with me? We are living in a time that is chaotic. This is a chaos time right now. And what do you have? You have peace living on the inside of you. But God didn't give you just his presence. God didn't give you just his peace. Check this out. God gave you his power. His power is with us. When you walk into school, you're walking in with his presence, his peace, and oh, by the way, his power. And then I, I will guarantee you this. Every parent needs to hear this. Every student. You're gonna have to forgive somebody here soon. And you might've already had to do that multiple times. Boyfriend, girlfriend, mom, dad, brother, sister. His forgiveness is in us and with us. And here's why I wanna encourage you with that. Parents, there are times if your kids were like our kids that you're gonna just have to say, I forgive you. And then there are other times you're gonna have to switch it around and say, will you forgive me for what I did? There are times with my son, there, I knew there were times that I had to just go to him and say, Michael, forgive me. I just said something to you and the way that I said it, I shouldn't have done that. Are y'all with me? Some of you parents would heal something with your kid the moment you would just go to them and say, I'm asking you to forgive me. So you're gonna walk into school this year. Parents, you're gonna have your kids go to school this year. Some of you are gonna walk into school as principals, as administrators, with his presence, with his peace, with his power. I love the fact that we're walking into school this year with the ability to forgive others the way that Jesus forgave. Can you say amen? amen. Talking about forgiveness, maybe you're here and you say, Pastor, if I was to die, I have absolutely no idea where I'm headed, number one, and number two, I don't know about Jesus the way you're talking about him. You act like you actually know him. And the reason why Jesus came to this earth was to get a relationship with you. That's, that's the whole idea. Jesus, the son of God, sent by his father who made this whole world that you live in, sent his son down here so he could have a relationship with you. My question to you is do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you wanna have one with him? Because no matter who you are, single mom, single dad, widowed individual that might be here and say, I, I, I'm just alone. You're never alone. Why? Because God is with us. His presence is with you. His peace is in you. Maybe you're here and you say, man, I never came into a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you're here and you think, you know what? I sort of thought I was proxying on my, on my mom and my dad. I'm, I'm like, yeah, I'm a Christian because of them. But I want to I wanna encourage you. You have to come into a personal relationship with Jesus. So I want to pray with you. And if you're here and you say, Pastor, at one time I had that, but I got away from God, like big time. Or Pastor, I've never have received Christ, but I want to come into a relationship with him here. 
You've heard me say this often lately about repentance and repentance means to turn. And in this moment, there are times, even as a Christian, that you need to repent and say, I'm gonna get away from this junk I've been doing and turn towards God. Or maybe you're hearing it's the first time you're saying, God, I'm gonna repent and turn from the way I'm living and I'm gonna turn to Jesus. I wanna come into a relationship with you. So I wanna pray a simple prayer. And maybe you're here and during this prayer, you're going to come into agreement with it and say, yes, you're gonna pray it out of your mouth. I need Jesus in my life. So could we close our eyes just for one moment? Bow our heads. I want you to repeat this simple prayer. If you need Christ or you wanna recommit your life to Christ, pray this simple prayer with me from your heart, from your mouth. Say this out loud. Oh God, I repent of my sins. I ask Jesus Christ to come into my heart. Forgive me now of all my sins. I call you Jesus, my Lord and my Savior. I thank you now. My sins are forgiven and I'm a new person in Christ. In Jesus' name I pray.